Are there any significant changes you think could be made to either current U.S. E economic policy or Federal Reserve policy or tax laws to get the economy healthy and growing in the U.S.? Yeah, we really had our foot to the floor in both monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, you know, you've seen it obviously on the monetary side with extended period of effectively zero interest rates and actually with the chairman just the other day saying this is going to go on for an extended period. Uh, and then they asked him what an extended period meant and he was, he said an extended period. The, uh, but we, no, it's hard to imagine pushing harder on, on monetary policy than has occurred. The interesting thing is people think of fiscal policy and they think, well, we had a stimulus bill. Well, if you think about what stimulus really is, it, it's not whether you call something a stimulus bill. If you had something that was called a stimulus bill and you didn't run a deficit, it would not be a, you know, it would not be a, a stimulus. You'd be, uh, uh, and if, if you don't have anything you call a stimulus bill at all, but you're spending 10% more of your GDP than you're taking in, you are applying an incredible stimulus, fiscal stimulus, to the economy. We have a huge fiscal stimulus program going on now, and it's called taking in 15% of GDP and spending 25% of GDP. That's, that's extraordinary. So I think that we have used those levers in a way that's almost unprecedented. And I think it's been wise in general to do what's done. And I think it was particularly wise what was done in, in the fall of 2008. But I think generally we have followed the right policies. I think they're less important than most people think they are. I think if you did the wrong policies, it, would, it could really screw things up. But, but I don't, I don't, I think the natural resuscitative powers of capitalism are, will be the biggest factor in taking us out. And I think you've seen that over the last two years and we're seeing it month by month. I would say this, residential construction is flatlined at you know, 500,000 or so uh, uh, units per year. Uh, I think when it comes back, and it will, but it will take, it takes working off a crazy excess inventory we had, and there's no way to do that except through creating fewer residential units than you create households. That's how you reduce the oversupply. When that ends, when that part comes back, I think you're going to see much more of a pickup uh, in employment than you might think just by looking at construction workers. I mean, we have Shaw carpets, you know, I'm sure they're not counted as construction jobs, but we have thousands fewer people working there because residential construction is where it is. And we have people at the furniture mart and, and how, many there, how much carpet they're selling or houses. So I think there's a lot of indirect as well as direct uh, a reservoir of, of jobs uh, that will be drawn upon uh, or, or utilized uh, when residential construction comes back. I don't think I'd measure it just by the number of construction workers that are uh, being employed currently versus say four or five years ago. Uh, and I th it, it will come back. I don't, know, I, I don't know when. I said in the annual report, I thought you'd be seeing it by the end of the year. I may or may not be right on that, but I, that would be my guess, best guess still. We are creating households faster than we're creating, creating uh, housing units. And you know, we lose housing units. Just, you know, you can look at the, you know, with tornadoes recently. And so there are, that problem will get cured. And I don't think when you mentioned we're progressing more slowly than other places, certainly in terms of, of Asia, you know, there's no question about it or Brazil, but, but actually I think our pace of coming out of this while it's, it's been sl slow, Compared to the hit we took in 2008, the American economy was paralyzed. It's really, it's come back quite a distance and we see that in, in our businesses. Now, you know, our peak on rail car loadings were 219,000 one week, I believe, uh, in 2006. But, 
and our bottom was 150 or 51,000. We'll probably run 190,000 or thereabouts currently, and that'll pick up more as the year goes along. So it's come back a significant way. We have certain companies that are setting records that serve basic industries. If you look at TTI, which makes, which distributes electronic components, has thousands and thousands of customers all over the world, and it's setting new records, and it's, it's way up in the first quarter, and it set a record last year. If you look at ISCAR, which supplies nothing but basic industry, I mean, nobody buys little carbon cutting tools, you know, to put in their recreation room or anything. This stuff is used, you know, for making big things, and their business is going up and up and up, you know, month by month. So the, the economy is coming back, and, and uh, when residential construction finally gets this huge overhang, uh, largely eliminated. I, I think uh, I think you'll see a lot of improvement uh, in the employment picture. Charlie. Yeah, the one place that I feel we're making a huge mistake is not learning enough from the big mess that came from wretched excess in our financial system. I don't think we throttled the sin and folly out of that aspect of the economy nearly enough. And I think if you look at all the panics and depressions of the United States, they all came from financial collapses, usually preceded by perfectly asinine and greedy behavior. And I think there would be a lot to be said for taking uh, an ax to our financial s sector and whittling it down to a more constructive size. Well, tell us more about how you use that ax. Well, Warren, I'll make myself ridiculous, but I guess I'm so old I'm entitled to do that. <laughs> the, I would have the tax system discourage trading. I would have various kinds of Tobin taxes. I would have securities trading more with the frequency of real estate than the trading way computer algorithms were one person's computers outwit another person's computers in what amounts to sort of legalized front running. I don't think we need any of that stuff. And I think making heroes out of the people who succeed at it is not good for the fiber of the country either. I hate the idea that 25% of our best engineers are going into the financial sector. So I think it's crazy what we've allowed. And I think the lack of contrition in our financial sector after the disgraceful stuff they got us into is perfectly awesome. It makes Dave Sokol look like a hero. He's getting warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just as a sidelight, you know, how many of you know that if you trade an S&P future contract, uh, 500, S&P 500 contract, and you hold it for 10 seconds, and you have a profit that 60% of the gain is long-term gain and 40% is short-term gain. So essentially, our Congress has said that this activity should be more lightly taxed, you know, than cleaning washrooms or, or doing all the things that you people do every day. That uh, you get a special tax treatment now. That illustrates one of the problems with the tax code, in that there's a few people that care intensely about having that in there, and the cost of it, in terms of less revenue for the U.S. government, is diffused among a large group, none of whom have enough interest to want to go out and write their congressman or hire a lobbyist to fight the other way. But it's pretty extraordinary that uh, we have decided that that particular form of activity should uh, should get 60 percent taxed at a 15 percent maximum rate, even though it may only take 10 or 20 seconds and be just a little flicker on a screen. And the hedge fund operators of America get a much lower tax rate than the professors of physics or the drivers of taxis. This is demented.
Well, with that, we're getting to our break at noon, and I promised, I made a bet three years ago with some fellows that run a fund of funds, and I promised to put the figures up uh, every year as to how we're doing. It's a 10-year deal, and, and if we can put up the slide, what number would that be? Probably five. Um, as you can see, these fund of funds, these are five fund of funds groups chosen by uh, these people who I like, uh, Ted Sidus and his friends, and, and uh, Ted couldn't be with us today, but uh, we will put these figures up annually. He got off to a very good start with his group. Uh, obviously, hedge funds should do better in a down market, but, uh, and we haven't caught him yet with the S&P 500, but it'll give you all a reason to keep coming back over the next seven years as I report regularly on, on how we are doing uh, in the, uh, in the S&P 500 versus the five fund of funds. As, as Carol pointed out in an article recently, or a, or a, uh, maybe it was on the web, on, uh, in reporting on this, she, she uh, looked at the bottom line where, uh, the investors in the S&P 500 are behind for the three years and the Investors in the fund of funds are behind, and the only people that are ahead so far are the investment managers. <laughs> They're doing very well at, the, at this point. So we'll keep you up to date on that. We're going to take a break. I thought, since we are creating a record, I wanted to clarify uh, two points. Uh, the Berkshire law firm, namely Munger, Tolles, and Olson, worked with the Lubrisol uh, Council in pulling together what Warren described as Lubrisol's proxy describing the background of the transaction. We as counsel for Berkshire started to work on that, gathering the facts pertaining to Berkshire's involvement, essentially David Sokol's and Warren's, uh, during the week of March 15. Warren, in speaking to you about the facts this morning, I believe, placed the beginning of that work in the subsequent week. So I simply wanted to clarify uh, that uh, as we gathered the facts, and though gathering included uh, uh, several interviews of David Sokol uh, during that week. Uh, secondly, uh, in describing internal policies uh, at Berkshire to protect against misbehavior or negligent behavior. Berkshire maintains a, something that uh, those in the trading business describe as restricted lists, and down that restricted list are any securities in which Berkshire is buying, selling, has a peculiar interest and that prohibits any of the corporate officers or um, the top officers of the subsidiaries of Berkshire from participating in trades in those securities without the assent, consent of the CFO, Mark Hamburg. That is what I wanted to clarify, Warren. Thanks, Ron. Yeah.